Between 2000 and 2010, Mercedes-Benz and McLaren joined forces to create one of the most special sports cars in history. With an emphasis on special, I'd say, not so much on sports car. The SLR has never been the greatest sports car on earth. But the more you look into it, the more you have to appreciate how special and exotic it is. At a first quick glance, you might mistake it for a slightly more extrovert version of an SL. But the SLR is a very different breed in almost every detail. It is such a unique package and there's a lot to talk about, not only about the car itself, but also the extraordinary project setting that brought it to life. So let's dive right into it and as always we start with a little walk through history. SLR is one of the biggest names in Mercedes-Benz history and it means a lot if Mercedes decides to revive these letters. The origins go back to the W196, a hugely successful Formula 1 race car designed by Rudolf Uhlenhaut. This amazing car helped Juan Manuel Fangio win the World Championship twice in 1954 and 1955. And from that open-wheel monoposto, Mercedes derived a two-seater sports car with a streamlined closed-wheel body. This car was designed to tackle the World Sports Car Championship in 1955 and it was called 300 SLR. It was literally an unbeatable race car. The debut took place at the legendary 1955 Millimilia that Sterling Moss won so unforgettably, setting up a record that is still valid today. In what people call the most epic drive of any person ever, Moss completed the 1000 miles in 10 hours, 7 minutes and 48 seconds on public roads in 1955. There's simply no words to describe it. His achievement is completely unbelievable, superhuman. And obviously, he was driving a very quick car. My God, this car really was a supercar. Only Mercedes could build a car like that. In that season, the 300 SLR went on to win the Irish Tourist Trophy, the Targa Florio, the Nürburgring and the Swedish Grand Prix. And in the end, Sterling Moss and the SLR were the world champions of the 1955 sports car season. All that was, of course, completely overshadowed by the horrible disaster at the 24 hours of Le Mans the biggest motor racing tragedy in history. In a high-speed accident involving three cars, the 300 SLR of Pierre Levesque went airborne, crashed into the crowd of spectators on the packed grandstand and catched fire. The horrible crash has killed 84 people. It's by far the most catastrophic event in motorsports history. As a consequence, Mercedes decided to completely retire from motor racing for more than three decades. And this was also the end of the 300 SLR as a race car. Shortly before Le Mans, Mercedes had already built two very special closed roof versions of it. These Galwin coupes were intended to compete at the Carrera Panamericana at the end of the season. All that did not happen due to the tragedy of Le Mans, so they ended up as Rudolf Uhlenhaut's company cars. You gotta picture this, basically a Formula 1 car with a Galwin body on a business trip. Top speed, 118 miles per hour. And this version of the 300 SLR quickly received the nickname Uhlenhaut Coupe. Many experts say they are the most precious cars in existence. Fangio's W196 race car sold at an auction in 2013 for nearly 30 million US dollars. And the Uhlenhaut Coupe would be far beyond that, probably in the three digit millions. But actually, they are just priceless because they won't ever be sold, hopefully. For me, it is quite simply the single greatest automobile in history. And this is the car the modern SLR refers to. So the stakes couldn't be any higher. Time to set up the most ambitious supercar project. In the decades after these amazing gullwing years, Mercedes has pretty much abandoned the supercar territory. All we got were a few experimental cars, the C111 series in the 1970s, and the C112 in 1991, but nothing you could actually buy. It was in the mid-90s when Mercedes finally decided that it was time for a new brand shaping icon. The company was right at the beginning of a massive transformation, which should fundamentally reinvent the whole brand. Initiated by Mercedes boss Jürgen Hubert, the whole product lineup was renewed from the ground up to offer much more diversity to the customer. From a very conservative company that at the beginning of the 90s offered three main model lines, plus SL and G-Wagon, they started to introduce all kinds of more progressive niche models. The SLK, the CLK 
the A-Class or the ML, trying to give Mercedes a more modern, more youthful image. Another important pillar of that strategy to rejuvenate Mercedes-Benz was to put sportiness back at the core of the brand. During the 90s, this happened mainly on track, with Mercedes getting back into various motor racing activities. The C-Class touring cars in DTM and ITC, the CLK GTR and CLK LM in the FIA GT Championship, two dramatic but unsuccessful years at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and ultimately the return of the Silver Arrows in Formula 1. So they went pretty much all in, in many different racing series. The missing link to create an authentic connection between the racing and the road models was, of course, a proper Mercedes-Benz sports car. There were some cautious activities to create sportier versions of their sedans, in partnership with a the back then still independent and quite unknown company called AMG. They created cars like the C36 or the E50, but at that point it was nothing entirely bespoke, or even remotely within the supercar segment. But the general idea for such a halo car was always in the room. It was part of strategic discussions within Mercedes already early in the 1990s. And even the partnership with McLaren for such a project was discussed between Jürgen Hubbard and McLaren boss Ron Dennis years before it actually became reality. The long-term path, to sketch it very briefly, was to return to Formula 1 as an engine supplier, at some point respray the cars and revive the legend of the Silver Arrows, go on to win the F1 World Championship and then create the ultimate Mercedes supercar in a joint project with McLaren. Steps 1, 2 and 3 were well underway and accomplished by the end of 1998. Mika Hakkinen finished the Formula 1 season as world champion ahead of Michael Schumacher and McLaren Mercedes took the constructors title for their MP413 race car. And this finally meant all lights on green to make step 4, the supercar project. It was codenamed Project 7 within McLaren and C199 at Mercedes. The official kickoff took place in 1999. It ultimately led to an intensified partnership between Mercedes and McLaren, both in Formula 1 and in road car business. And shortly after, in January 2000, Daimler Chrysler would invest to take over a 40% stake in the McLaren Group. Somebody said a marriage in heaven. So the project was set up, the budget was there, and it was time to get to work. The early concept and design phase for the SLR was certainly very unusual, since it happened pretty much separated within these two companies. On the one hand, Mercedes was working on their vision for the future Silver Arrows supercar, which was mainly a job performed within the styling department. And on the other hand, McLaren, in a team led by Gordon Murray, was working on the layout and fundamental design concept of Project 7. And it's no secret that these two sides had very different ideas and opinions in mind when sketching the ultimate supercar. Let's have a close look at Mercedes first, because their activities started already in 1998, about a year before McLaren really kicked off the project on their side. And again, you have to keep in mind what kind of company Mercedes was back then. The general mindset within the company at that time was not at all influenced by serious sports or race cars. This was literally none of their business. The most sporty road legal Mercedes on the market was the SLR 129 and all the racing activities were handled by AMG and happened pretty much in a parallel universe. The glorious times of the Silver Arrows and cars like the 300 SLR were more than 40 years ago. Mercedes was at its core a manufacturer of luxurious heavy sedans. And the way they approached the idea of a new supercar was basically to create an Uber SL more luxurious, more powerful, a bit more dramatic styling. This car should provide all the comfort and safety and tech you'd expect from a Mercedes. They were not inclined to build some hardcore racer and thereby compromise the Mercedes DNA. The second major premise, they wanted to create this authentic connection to the 1950s SLR and therefore were very reluctant to start from anything else but a long hood front engine layout. The result can be seen in these first sketches from mid-1998 and also in the first showcar, Vision SLR, that was presented in Detroit 1999. This was the pure Mercedes vision of the story, without McLaren really being involved yet. It was the work of a man called Gordon Wagoner, a 30-year-old designer within the team of chief designer Peter Pfeiffer. The SLR was his very first project at Mercedes and he was able to win the internal contest for the most promising key sketches 
and convince the design bosses and the board of management. Ten years from there, he would become the chief designer for Mercedes-Benz. And this very first project of Wagner is already a textbook example for his famous design strategy of sensual purity. Especially the sensual part. I believe the SLR stands out from the competition due to its very emotional, sensual surfacing. And I think that's a very unique and also courageous approach for a supercar. That's nothing you usually see in that segment. Supercars tend to be much more aggressive and also more technical and clinical. Designed more like a machine. The SLR in comparison is almost a bit romantic. And that's clearly the signature of Gordon Wagner. And obviously, in his Vision SLR, you recognize all the styling themes of the later production version. The four eye headlamps, the sculpted front hood, and the prominent F1 inspired nose. That was the key design theme, and it was kept till the end. The overall concept and the proportions, however, have evolved significantly during the process. At that point in 1998, they were clearly less radical and much more similar to a standard SL like the R230, which was being developed at the same time. Underneath the body of the Vision SLR was a V8 in a standard front engine package with a standard exhaust layout. It also featured a generous greenhouse to provide the spacious cabin of a Mercedes luxury coupe. So yeah, as I said, it was basically an Uber SL. And now let's switch to the other side to McLaren and Gordon Murray and his team of engineers being tasked to design this new supercar. And just in case any of you don't know, Gordon Murray was one of the most brilliant engineers and most ingenious car designers in the world. He designed more than 20 Formula One cars, eight of them becoming world champions. And then at the beginning of the 90s, he designs the McLaren F1, which by a lot of people is still today considered the greatest sports car in history. And now, 10 years after the F1, he saw the chance to create an even better, more refined evolution of this car, with all the money and support and resources from Mercedes. What a lifetime opportunity. And what a disappointment it must have been when he received the first input from Mercedes on their vision of the ultimate supercar, this luxurious front-engined SL+. This couldn't have been much further apart from what he had in mind, and I'm pretty sure that at times he considered leaving this job. But being a professional, he probably said, yeah, let's see what we can do. So starting in 1999, over around one year, they ran their basic feasibility studies, comparing different concepts and packaging solutions. They didn't give up easily on their very much preferred rear mid-engine layout and tried to convince Mercedes time and time again that this was the direction to go in terms of driving dynamics and performance. But the guys in Stuttgart were just as firmly convinced about how the overall proportion should be and where the engine had to sit. In the front, of course. And the enthusiastic public reception of their Detroit show car seemed to support their point that this was the exact car the customers would want and pay for. Certainly no mid-engine sports car without any precedence in the Mercedes history. It must have been a proper clash between these two companies and convictions, and I can only imagine how it brought the whole collaboration to the brink of failure quite a few times. But in the end, Mercedes simply had the upper hand, and McLaren had actually not much choice but to develop something they were not entirely convinced of. So instead of wasting their energies with endless arguments, they focused on improving the front engine car as much as they could, lowering the center of gravity, and improving the overall balance. They moved the front axle forward by around 200 millimeters and pushed the engine completely behind the axle, which in combination with a dry sump enabled a much lower engine position. They also succeeded in packaging the entire exhaust system in front of the firewall, exiting through side pipes behind the front wheels. This allowed the cabin floor to be closer to the ground and also a completely flat underbody for improved aero underneath the car. The rear end was raised substantially to increase downforce and high speed stability. And while the engineers at McLaren were still struggling to embrace the concept, Mercedes, only eight months after the Vision SLR, presented a second show car. This time it was a Roadster with a soft top and a few styling updates at the rear end, already much closer to the later production version. But the underlying platform of the concept was carried over from the Vision SLR Coupe, so it was again another front-engine sports car. They really made sure nobody would dare to question that concept again. 
and McLaren with their move to push the boundaries and create this radical front mid-engine layout seemed to have found a compromise that everybody could live with and not lose their faces entirely. The next step would be to turn the concepts and ideas into hardware. The first mule cars were some very mysterious creatures based on a TVR Cerbera. They were built towards the end of 2000, probably two or three vehicles in total. The aim was to approve the general concept and package and test main components within a similar architecture. Here's a rare video in terrible quality of that mule being tested on the benched Mercedes track in Stuttgart unter Türkheim in 2001. The second batch of prototypes came in 2002 and these were the first ones based on bespoke SLR chassis. McLaren has built 19 XP vehicles in total. They weren't heavily camouflaged as the design was already pretty known since the 1999 show cars. But special features like for instance the side exhaust were still hidden and fake rear exhausts were added to create some distraction. On top of the 19 XP vehicles came a few crash prototypes to ensure the proper function of the passive safety concept and run all the tests required for certification. The final prototype phase took place in 2003 with near production designs. For the first time these cars were also shown to customers and journalists. We're now only weeks away from the start of production. The brand new factory in Woking was almost completed. McLaren and Mercedes have invested 300 million pounds into the stunning Norman Foster design McLaren Technology Center where the SLR manufacture should take place. The volume of the supercar segment at that time was about 2,500 cars each year and Mercedes planned to conquer quite a big chunk of that cake, targeting at around 20%. That would mean 500 vehicles per annum or 3,500 cars in a typical seven-year life cycle. And that's the capacity the factory was designed for. The small series build process was mostly based on manual operations with nine stations to assemble the entire car, five hours at each station before the car would enter the final inspection before delivery. In 2003, 20 pre-production vehicles were built to test and improve the production process and all the new facilities. Also, four marketing prototypes were built to be able to create the footage of the final product ahead of its reveal. The official start of production took place in summer 2003, a few weeks before the SLR Coupe was finally presented to the public. And Mercedes has prepared something very special for that event. It was September 8, 2003, in the Italian town of Brescia. Almost 50 years before, this was the place where Sterling Moss set off his unforgettable drive to win the Mille Miglia in his Mercedes 300 SLR. It was a spectacular event at this historical place. Sterling Moss was there, as well as his 722 record car. And the very first Modern Times SLR was fully revealed. This specific car, by the way, was XP13, one of the pre-production prototypes. And from there, the SLR, driven by Kimi Raikkonen and Alexander Wurz, and accompanied on the first miles by Sterling Moss in his 1955 SLR, was heading off towards Frankfurt for the official world premiere on the motor show the next day. Of course, the basic styling theme was nothing new, since the show cars revealed it four years earlier. But the production version being presented was, due to its technical concept, much more radical and even more breathtaking than most people had expected. The Formula One inspired front design, the butterfly doors, the side vents with the side pipe exhaust, and most of all, the incredible proportions. This SLR was way beyond any ordinary SL. It was very exciting in terms of its looks and especially considering all the tech underneath, which we'll have a closer look at in a minute. The Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren, and yes, that is the correct name, first Mercedes-Benz, then SLR, and the McLaren suffix at the end, was the star of that year's IAA and on the covers of all car magazines. Finally, here was the new Silver Arrow supercar that so many people have been dreaming of for years. Deliveries of the first SLRs began shortly after the world premiere, with prices starting at 435,000 euros in Germany. Which was a lot of money. To put this into perspective, the much more limited and V10-powered Porsche Carrera GT, which was introduced that same year, was pretty much at the same spot and a V12 Ferrari 575M was less than half the price of an SLR. So this was a very bold and confident positioning by the Mercedes pricing strategists. The main reason for that price tag, of course, was the exotic content of the SLR, which 
was not cheap. So let's have a closer look at all the tech inside the SLR. Let's start with the chassis of the car and I guess it's fair to say that this is also the single most special element of the SLR in terms of tech. The whole monocoque is made from carbon fiber, which except for a few CLK GTR homologation specials is a first for a street legal Mercedes. And it's not only the monocoque, it's also the entire exterior panels. Doors, front hood, trunk, roof, fenders, even the crest structures on front and rear are made of carbon fiber, which has never been done before on a serious production car. The only non-carbon fiber elements within the body are the front longitudinals, supporting the front axle and the engine, and a rear subframe where suspension and differential are attached to. These two are made from die-cast aluminium. Now let's have a look at the heart of the SLR, the M155 V8. After you've managed to open the front hood, which is quite a complex mechanism, what you see is probably one of the best looking engine bays of any modern Mercedes. They really seem to have paid attention to that, which in my opinion Mercedes not always does. But this is simply beautiful. The intake air for the engine actually enters through the Mercedes star and then runs through a section of air guiding and filtering elements. Basically the first half of the engine bay is nothing but air guiding. The engine itself, as discussed earlier, starts way back behind the front axle. It's a 5.4 litre supercharged V8 that is derived from the M113. The M113 was a family of 5 litre three valve Mercedes-Benz engines widely spread over basically all the upper Mercedes lineup at the beginning of the 2000s. S500, E500, G500 and so on. And then there was a bigger 5.4 litre version of it, developed and built by AMG, still naturally aspirated and installed in cars like a C55, E55, S55 and so on. On top of that came the incredibly torquey supercharged version, the M113K, which was first applied on the famous SL55 compressor but also on the CLK DTM with up to 582 horsepower. Now the engine on the SLR is basically that M113K, but AMG has further increased its performance with higher boost pressure of the supercharger, optimized charge air cooling and a pretty significant redesign of the whole engine, switching to a closed deck cylinder block and a bad plate crankcase design. Plus, to enable a low mounted front mid engine, they made the switch to a dry sump. And this upgraded engine in this configuration was then called M155. It delivered 626 horsepower in the standard SLR and went up to 650 horsepower and 820 newton meters of torque in later versions, which we'll speak about in the next chapter. So the M155 was a very bespoke engine and exclusively installed on the SLR. What makes it so special besides the impressive performance figures is the very distinct noise. To the dark V8 rumble comes the whine of the supercharger at higher revs and it creates this pretty unique and exotic sound experience. The engine was mated to a pretty ordinary Mercedes 5-speed automatic gearbox as it was used since 1996 in many Mercedes or Maybach models. The version on the SLR was called Speedshift R and has been reinforced and adapted by AMG with additional SLR specific operating modes. For instance, in manual mode, you could adjust the shift speeds in three levels from sport to super sport and race. But basically nothing but a high end version of the good old 5 speed torque converter NAG1, which obviously has drawn some criticism from car testers and customers. Much more extraordinary, but not only in a good way, was the braking system. It's a notorious SBC system, Sensortronic Brake Control, an electrohydraulic system where the brake pressure on each wheel is calculated and applied individually, allowing all kinds of new comfort and safety functions. But the system was utterly complex and caused Mercedes a lot of headache and triggered some of the biggest recalls of their history. On the E-Class, they even removed SBC during the life cycle and went back to a conventional hydraulic system. The SLR, however, kept it till the end of production, so you'll always get features like traffic jam braking assist, automatic dry braking in rain or a soft stop function. What you don't get though is a proper feel for the brakes, which would have been really nice on a super sports car. It's honestly one of the biggest flaws on the SLR in my opinion. The system just doesn't provide you a lot of feel and finding the correct amount of brake pressure to generate the intended deceleration is really not that easy. 
It's a shame because the brakes themselves are excellent. Eight piston at the front, four piston at the rear, huge carbon ceramic discs all around as standard. On top you get the active air brake, which deploys by 65 degrees under braking at higher speeds and thus increases rear downforce. Another nice feature that we've already seen on the 300 SLR race car some 50 years earlier. And now let's have a quick look at the interior, but honestly don't expect too much there. Mercedes and McLaren have clearly spent all the money on exterior and tech. The cockpit and the cabin might be a bit underwhelming in comparison. I think it's quite an enjoyable cabin and there are a few nice spec options, but I don't think it's bespoke enough for a car that's almost half a million euros. The main difference in the cockpit architecture between this car and an SL is actually that you don't get a big screen head unit. On the SLR the radio is hidden under this cover in the center console which I think is a nice move to make the cockpit truly timeless, since multimedia and screens usually don't age very well. That SLR badge on top, yeah, I think that could have been a bit more subtle. And frankly, I would have preferred an interior where you don't have to be reminded that it's an actual SLR you're sitting in, but okay. That engine start button on the automatic shift lever is another nice feature, but all the rest is nothing entirely overwhelming. It's a beautiful Mercedes cockpit, but nothing more. The one highlight for me in this interior is unfortunately something you can't really see as long as you sit in the car, and it's the seat design. A beautiful one-piece carbon fiber shell with several paddings attached that you could get in five different sizes from S to XXL. These seats are completely bespoke for the SLR and a beautiful lightweight solution. Between the two seats you'll find a seamlessly integrated Mercedes-Benz phone of the very latest generation. And on that bombshell it is time to show you the many different SLR variants that were introduced during the life cycle. So we've talked mainly about the standard SLR coupe so far, introduced in 2003 and starting at 435,000 euros in Germany. Three years later, in 2006, Mercedes introduced the first special edition, which quite obviously was already a reaction to the level of SLR demand, which was not entirely satisfying and below the original sales plannings. So they came up with the 722 edition, which was basically a slightly more powerful SLR with a styling package. The engine produced now 650 horsepower, being the most powerful M155 evolution. And on the exterior, the 722 came with darker front and rear lamps, forged 19 inch wheels in dark gray and red brake calipers, a bit more visible carbon fiber on the front and rear bumpers, and of course 722 badges on the fenders. The suspension was lowered by 10 millimeters and the dampers were slightly stiffer. The edition was limited to 150 units and starting at 476,000 euros in Germany. They were sold out pretty quickly and quite understandably so. I mean the additional content was certainly not horrific, but the strict limitation was the interesting bit. And today, the 722 models are extremely sought after. While you can get a standard SLR coupe for around half of its original price, a mint condition 722 is almost double its original price. So these were really great investments and perfect collector's cars. The next variant was not a total surprise, since Mercedes has already teased it as a show car in 1999. It was finally introduced eight years later, in 2007, and another attempt to boost the SLR demand. McLaren has on many occasions claimed that a Roadster was not originally planned and not really feasible within the chassis design. But well, here it was, and I think it's a fantastic iteration of the SLR theme. Normally I clearly prefer coupes over Roadsters, whether it's an SLS or a GT or any other sports car. But with the SLR I'm not entirely sure. I think the Roadster is really lovely and it suits the overall character of this car pretty well, being this enjoyable Gran Turismo and not so much a hardcore racer. Also I think the fabric roof is just perfectly integrated, a very slim and elegant execution. And there are beautiful color options as well, so you just have one more degree of freedom to create a very unique and luxurious spec. The share of Roadsters within the total SLR volume was above 30% which is pretty high, especially considering its late market launch and the very short production time of only two years. The next step in the SLR portfolio was pretty logic. After the 722 and the Roadster came the 722 Roadster. And you basically got all the content of the 722 edition within the open roof SLR. So there's not really much to talk about. 
The only thing which was not entirely logic was its name. For whatever reason, this car was called 722S. Sales began in early 2009, and just as the coupe, it was limited to 150 units. And again, a highly collectible model, one of the most expensive and sought after SLR variants today. The next variant and the final car that left the production line was the SLR Sterling Moss, the pinnacle of the SLR lineup, and by quite a margin, the most radical version. It was a no roof, no windscreen speedster design inspired by the great 300 SLR race cars from 1955. A very bold move and one of the most special cars in history. Introduced more than 10 years before the latest hype around speedsters came up with Ferrari Monza, McLaren Elva or Aston Martin V12 speedster. Here's a picture of the very cool Sterling Moss prototype that I didn't want you to miss. The final design was presented at the Detroit Motor Show in 2009 with production starting in the second half of that year. And this is not simply an SLR where they've cut off the roof and the windscreen. The car's exterior is actually entirely new. Not a single exterior panel is carried over from the standard SLR. Front and rear lights are bespoke. The side pipes are new. The doors completely redesigned, including mechanisms and wing mirrors. You get a new 19-inch wheel design exclusively for the Sterling Moss. And also the interior is heavily revised with a new instrument panel, steering wheel and seat design. Except for the platform and the powertrain, which is borrowed from the 722, this was basically a new car. McLaren has built 75 units only, and the price tag was 892,000 euros. But money alone wasn't even enough to get one. The car was offered exclusively to people that already owned at least one SLR. Today, the Sterling Moss is somewhere around 2 to 2.5 million euros. So again, blessed are those who bought one from factory. And that was it. 75 Sterling Moss assembled and in December 2009 the SLR production was officially over. 2,157 cars left the Woking factory over six years. This was much less than the 3,500 cars that were intended to be built when the production started. But still I think it's a significant number and the SLR is actually the best-selling car within that exclusive price segment of around half a million euros. So it was actually quite successful. The forecast was just not very accurate. When you look at supercar sales in general, what they usually do is they have a huge peak in the first or second full production year, but then tend to decline very quickly. So I guess the Mercedes estimate to take 20% of the supercar market was realistic for the first years after the launch, but not for the entire life cycle. Another self-made mistake as I see it was arguably the very early reveal of the near production design with the two 1999 show cars. So when the car was finally introduced and offered for sale, the basic design was already known for almost five years. Another issue that didn't help towards the end of the life cycle was certainly the financial crisis of 2008. But however, overall, I think the sales figures can be seen as quite a success from Mercedes, especially considering the SLR being their debut within the supercar segment. And the five SLR versions that we've just seen are actually not the end of the story. These five, Standard Coupe and Roadster, 722 Coupe and Roadster plus Sterling Moss, are just the official SLR lineup as sold by Mercedes-Benz. There are, however, a few more models with a bit of a different background because they've all been converted from standard SLRs. But still, they deserve a special mention. First, the 722 GT, a very unique and exciting SLR version, but also quite a weird story. The 722 GT was a racing version of the SLR Coupe, designed in 2007 at the special request by a few customers within the SLR club. They had the intention to set up a sort of cup series uniquely for SLR race cars, the so-called SLR Club Trophy. So Mercedes and McLaren, after a few internal studies, commissioned the race car engineers at RML to convert 21 SLRs into race cars. The main modifications were primarily weight reduction of around 350 kilograms, a new exterior body kit with wider tracks front and rear, a massive wing, full carbon brakes and a slight power upgrade due to optimized air intakes and exhausts. When the car was finished though, we were right in the middle of the global financial crisis and the concept of billionaire gentleman racers was slightly out of place. As a consequence, only 12 cars were sold and the SLR trophy ended up being quite an embarrassment. 
with 2008 being the first and final racing season. Mercedes ultimately even bought most of the cars back from the customers and the whole project was buried. Nevertheless, a fascinating piece of SLR history. The second conversion project was the SLR McLaren edition, which was created in 2010 after the end of the SLR production and without Mercedes being involved at all. It was designed by McLaren Special Operations and can be seen as a more McLaren interpretation of what the SLR should have looked like. So it has a revised exterior styling, which to put it mildly, I have a few issues with. I respect everybody's taste and I know many people love this car and that's totally fine. I just don't think it treats the SLR with a lot of respect. In my very personal opinion, this could just as well have come out of Mansory or any other third class tuning company. Luckily, the package was very limited to only 25 units and you could send in either an SLR Coupe or Roadster to have it converted by MSO for around £150,000. Besides the body kit, these cars received a revised steering system, suspension setup and exhaust, which was definitely the better part of the modification. You sometimes see one of these additions being offered for sale at around 2 or 2.5 million euros. I'm not sure if these offers are serious, but my honest opinion, this is the single most ridiculous way to spend that amount of money. You can get 10 original SLR coupes for that price. One zero. So it's no secret, I don't love this chapter of the SLR history at all. Luckily, MSO didn't stop there. 10 years later, they came up with this. The SLR by MSO, another creation by the heritage team at McLaren Special Operations. But this time, the result is incredibly tasteful, subtle and with all due respect to the original. I honestly think this is one of the greatest interpretations of any SLR ever. It's a perfect upgrade to the original design and I was incredibly pleased when I saw this car in person. I was actually lucky enough to drive this exact car at the Hampton Court Palace Concours d'Elegance. It's by the way one of the very oldest SLR chassis, number 17 of the 20 pre-production prototypes. And for me it's an absolute masterpiece both on the exterior and on the interior. And also underneath the surface they've applied a few upgrades on steering, chassis and exhaust, getting rid of some of the SLR flaws without destroying the original character. So this is absolutely brilliant. And I'm happy to tell you there's more to come. MSO is really gearing up, creating more and more limited SLR conversions in the future. The last one I've heard about was a very special edition for Manny Koshpin, inspired by the Briggs Cunningham Gullwing. Some very nice stuff and I'm really excited about their activities and I truly admire what they are doing with the old lady SLR. Let's see what comes to their minds next. So, to tell the truth, the SLR story isn't really finished yet and that's a good thing. Let's try and sum it up. For me, the SLR was always and still is a fascinating product, an amazing project and a very significant piece of Mercedes history and literally a very unique one as well. The partnership between McLaren and Mercedes was terminated shortly after the end of the SLR production and the two companies would continue to go separate ways. Mercedes founded their own works Formula 1 team and McLaren established their own road car business. So what's the final verdict about the SLR project? I'm convinced it was at times very painful between these two companies, just because they had so different visions about what to create. You can only imagine the struggles they had about the right concept and execution. And you can feel these struggles within the car in many areas. The SLR certainly is anything but flawless. But I honestly love the SLR for a number of reasons and I'd like to point out three of them. First, it is this once in a lifetime joint venture between Mercedes and McLaren, two of the greatest brands in the whole industry. A very special constellation that hasn't happened before and will most probably never happen again. A Mercedes designed by Gordon Murray. He wasn't allowed to do what he wanted to do, which is a bit of a shame and arguably a missed opportunity. But still, it's a Gordon Murray Mercedes. You don't get that anywhere else. Second, the whole concept of this car is just very unique and exotic. At a time where more and more competitors were moving to rear mid engines, this car sits in a very special place. The classic proportions, long hood, front mid engine layout, 
the carbon fiber monocoque, the fantastic AMG V8, the butterfly doors. What an adorable package of a supercar that is. And third, it's Gordon Wagoner's first design at Mercedes, which is also in some way historic. I think the car is amazing to look at, incredibly beautiful and exciting and timeless. And it only gets better. Imagine this car in 2050. It will be an utter sensation. So, to come to a conclusion, I very much believe in the value of these cars. Compared to anything similar, they are really excellent value for money. 250,000 euros can get you a decent SLR coupe. And I'm convinced this is still very underrated. There are a few things to really pay attention to, so whenever you're interested in finding one, please get in touch with me. I'm very happy to help in finding your dream SLR or any other Mercedes supercar. That was the SLR story. I was really looking forward to getting this done. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and please subscribe. It's important.